Well, good morning. I welcome you to worship this morning. You may notice in the uh, bulletin it's a little different order of service because today we are doing a service of healing. And so at the beginning of the service, there will be um, the healing portion. And there is a point in which you are invited, if you would like, to come forward and kneel along the railings and you'll receive a laying on of hands, anointing with oil, and a prayer of healing, which you can see in the bulletin what will be said. So if you would like to come forward at that time, we invite you. Um, if not, um, please remain seated and sing the song that will be sung at that time. And um, that is how the service of healing goes. Um, then there will be a message and a communion. Uh, another, the meal of forgiveness and healing. Um, and so there are some ongoing themes today of, of this healing. Let us begin this morning with a prayer. Gracious God, we come today with our hearts open, ready to be filled with your fulfilling grace that we may be so full that we overflow and are enabled to fill others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us begin with our opening hymn. Uh, it is found on 617. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We gather to hear the word of God, pray for healing of every kind, spiritual, physical, and emotional, and ask God's blessing for health and wholeness through Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Great God, our healer, by your power, the Lord Jesus healed and gave hope. As we gather in his name, look upon us with mercy and bless us with your healing spirit. Bring us comfort in the midst of pain, strength to transform our weakness, and light to illuminate our darkness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, grant your healing grace to all who are sick, injured, or disabled, that they may be made whole. 
mend broken relationships and restore those in emotional distress to soundness of mind and serenity of spirit. Restore to wholeness whatever is broken in our lives, in this nation, and in the world. Hear us, O Lord of life. You may be seated. Sisters and brothers, I invite you to come and receive a sign of healing and wholeness in the name of the triune God. Amen. This time... As I said, you are invited to please come forward and you may kneel at either railing and we will sing the song.
I invite you to please stand and receive the blessing. Almighty God, who is a strong tower to all, to whom all things in heaven and on earth bow and obey, be now and evermore your sure defense and help you to know that the name given to us for health and salvation is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please take this time to share a sign of peace with one another. Oh, 
all and lifts up those who are bowed down. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you faithfully. A reading from the book of Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. Pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the, in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, Left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark. And Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted him, then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated, and I invite the kids to come forward for a children's message. Hello. Good morning. Ah, uh, so I have a question. Um, what can you think of some things that are really, really big? What are some things that are really, really big? Like big, big, big. Empire State Building. Yeah, it's big. What else is big? Church is big. Yep. Is there big animals? It's a really big animal. Giraffe, yep, that's big. Elephants are big. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Sharks are big. Yep. <laughs> um, how about, are mountains big? Yeah, mountains are big. Boats are big. Yeah, there's some really big boats. There's really little boats, too, but there's really big boats. Yeah. Your daddy's big. Yep. <laughs> the Titanic is big. Yeah. Well, do you think it's easy to pick up those big things? Like, would it be easy to just pick them up? No. And if they broke, would it be easy to put them back together? No. Probably not. Well, I was thinking about big things because uh, today in the story about Jesus, he had some really big problems. And sometimes we have problems that are like really big. Like he had something like 5,000 or more people and he needed to feed them and there was no food and there was no like McDonald's down the road or anything. They, he, how is he going to feed them? And... Let's see, what was another big problem he had? Oh, there was a big storm that came, and it was rocking the disciples' boat all over the place, and so that was a big problem. Oh, and then um, they wanted, the people wanted to grab him and force him to become their king, which is kind of crazy, but that was a big problem, too, because he didn't, he didn't want that. So he had all these big problems. And we hear that each of those problems gets kind of solved, right? Jesus feeds the crowd. He finds a way to avoid the crowd from taking him and making him king. He get, hides in the mountain. He goes up in the mountain and he hides <laughs> so they can't find him. He plays hide and seek with them. And then he reunites with the disciples when they're out there in the storm, he walks on the water, and immediately they get to where they need to go. So we don't really know how he solved all those problems, but they were big problems, and he solved them, which we have big problems, too, sometimes in our lives. And like Jesus, um, we can have God's help with dealing with those problems. And when we do, the problems don't go away, but we can feel help in um, finding a way through them. And, and a lot of times, the best way comes up for us. Um, and often that starts with our prayers and saying, God, this is a really big problem and I'm, I'm turning this over to you to help me solve it. And, you know, no problem's too big for God. No problem's too big for you or me or any of us when we ask God for help with our problems. So that's our good news for today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who reminds us that no problem is too big for you. and shows us how to invite you 
into our lives so that no problem is too big for us or those around us. Thank you and amen. All right, have a seat. I don't usually title my sermons, but this one is one that has a title. It's called No Regrets. Many people who followed Jesus on the day that he went up that mountain probably didn't have a lot going for them. They were free, for whatever reasons, to go hike nine miles Upper Galilee to go see an itinerant preacher and sit in the grass. We don't know much. We can speculate. Maybe they were loners who lacked community, people isolated for whatever reasons, people who needed somewhere, someone, something to belong to. And there on that mountainside they were fed. In this story we think the miracle is that 5,000 got fed. The miraculous thing is that a bunch of disconnected lonely lives sat together and began to share a meal together. That they discovered joy and fulfillment that comes from knowing that you belong to each other in the sense of belonging. In 2009, so it's that, eight years, nine years ago, I was watching the news one night, six o'clock news, and really got surprised because I saw some things on the news that looked really familiar my hometown. Now, I'm from a small town in Minnesota, about 1,200 people. So we don't really make the news. And if we do, you take notice. What I saw was that uh, along with a bunch of other towns that lined up Highway 212, which is a, a, a highway that goes west out of the out of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and uh, along that highway at, at a certain point, because of the railroad, every five miles there is a small town. Every, exactly five miles. And I'm, my hometown is kind of in the center of those every five miles small towns. What was happening was an everyday miracle. Kind of like the people who are fed on a mountainside and connected and, and create a community of belonging. There were hundreds of people lined up along Highway 212. Each of the communities. They were sitting in lawn chairs. They were piled along their cars all the way along the highway, 100 miles, waving American flags. They were welcoming home a fallen soldier. And if you are familiar with the homecoming of a fallen soldier, it's a very long, slow drive. Many didn't know him. They weren't present for him. They were present for his family and for his community so that they didn't grieve alone, so that they knew that they were grieving together, that they were part of something 
deeper, a deeper connection. It was a miraculous act of belonging to each other. It happened at the time when I was watching the news. I was studying Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in particular the text Ephesians three fourteen through 21. And I kind of came up with a loose translation of what Paul was praying in that text that we just read. Something like this. I fall down on my knees and I pray that your inward person be renewed day by day through the wear and tear of life's challenges and tribulations. Think about that. I pray that your inward person be renewed day by day through the wear and tear of life's challenges and tribulations. And how we can be worn down. Life provides plenty of challenges and tribulations, unfairness and tragedy and chaos, and they tear at our soul. And we can be like Philip, who is asked, how do we feed 5,000 random people gathered around here and, like Philip, see a hopeless task? Or we can be like Andrew, and we can scavenge to do our best and admit it's not enough. These two disciples, they display this heartbreaking blend of hopelessness or frustration. It's a common experience that comes when facing situations that are beyond our resources, beyond our control, situations that bring us to our knees in prayer or in despair. When we feel hopeless or frustrated, it's difficult for us to set our minds on thinking of solutions, right? We just want to curl up under the covers and hope it goes away. Our inward person seems the last thing that is renewed, and we give up. We close our minds to possibilities as life wears us down. I'll notice it in myself. I'll start saying, what's the point? What's the point? It's my favorite go-to thing. What's the point? Because I really want to know the point. Why? And when I start saying that, that's when I know I'm, I'm closing my mind off to possibilities. That I'm feeling overwhelmed by them. And I'll recognize hopeless thinking to be a sign that Something big probably needs to change in my life. That's the point. <laughs> and that's not easy. Those moments of hopelessness and frustration or calls for a shift in perspective. The feeling hopeless is a call for hope. <laughs> we really want hope when we're feeling hopeless, right? This shift in perspective, what that looks like. It, it occurs in the story in John 6. Jesus hears the words of Philip and of Andrew, and he feels their pain. And with a knowing look, he does something really crazy. He doesn't give up. He doesn't curl under the covers and say, oh, it's too much. He takes the little that they have. He takes what they have. Even though logically they're like, it's not enough. And he blesses it. And he trusts completely <laughs> that the people will be fed. And they are. They are not only fed, they are fed to the sensation of ultimate fullness, it says. And there are fragments to be gathered for leftovers. So what happened? I don't know. I don't know how this miracle happened. There's lots of suggestions. Maybe people brought little 
little lunches with them and they weren't going to share. And then when they saw the big sharing, they all started sharing. Maybe it just miraculously multiplied and it's a mystery. We don't know. But I do know that this is a story of a powerful uh, experience of community, of faith, of hope, a belonging and coming together, that it's a miracle because it's a shift in perspective. It's a miracle because they shift from it's hopeless, it's so frustrating, we just don't have enough, we got this much, but we just don't have enough, to saying what we have is going to work. Let's bless it. Let's trust. Let's take this leap of faith. And lo and behold, all are fed. Everyday miracles, like a line of flags along Highway 212, is a miracle shifting the perspective of an isolated grief for one family into communal grief of a whole county. Following the powerful event of John 6, Jesus returns to the mountaintop to be alone. In other Gospels, this time away is, is accounted as due to grief that he learned that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. We can only assume that this text Is, is, is about this grief, maybe, that drives him into a time of prayer and escape from the crowds. Whatever reason, while away, the disciples struggle to cross the waters in a horrible storm. And here's something that's different in this story from other stories in Gospels that talk about crossing lakes in a storm. There are a few. In this story, the storm is not stilled. It is not silenced. It is not calmed. You see, God can be present and reveal God's glory in the midst of the storm. And that may not mean that the storm goes away. Sometimes it doesn't. If the storms of your reality are blowing hard and you're filled with fear and hopelessness and frustration or grief, divine presence is still with you. A point to make from this little story is this. You don't have to wait for the trials of your life to calm down before you get God. You can get God, even in the middle of the storms. And I think that's kind of the idea of what Paul is leaning towards when he prays this prayer for the Ephesians. He wants us to understand that we need to be renewed day by day, and that renewal is an inner transformation change in perspective. He speaks of Christ dwelling in our hearts. And what dwelling meant is to take permanent residence. So Christ is not running a temporary lease, not renting. The permanent residence in your heart. And the heart the heart was understood differently in ancient Greece. We, we associate the heart with feelings, right? Feelings. Well, in ancient Greece, feelings came in your gut. We still have things that allude to that. Butterflies in your stomach. My stomach was flip-flopping. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, gut-wrenching. 
those are, those are terms that still we have associating feelings with our gut. Heart. Heart didn't mean your feelings. Feelings come and go. Christ takes permanent residence in your heart, which refers to our inner being. Heart meant the mind and spirit together, that, that blending. It meant the things that make us who we are. We'd, we'd say identity today. We'd say the heart went your I amness. That's what the heart meant. Not your feelings, but your true I amness. Like this is really, really deep. That's where Christ takes permanent residence, takes root, sustains us, transforms us, encourages us, strengthens us in, in this depth of being. In other words, becomes us, or we become Jesus. That's how close the identity of who we are and who Jesus is, is when Christ dwells in your heart. You're a little Christ. Finally, Paul prays that we should share the knowledge of Jesus in one undivided community. He talks about the oneness of community again and again in Ephesians, again in alluded to in in Romans. It's it's a common theme. And it's hard to imagine in our world today with all the political divisions and, and war and isolationism, this idea of oneness. But Paul refers to it again and again. So that is our vision. That is the vision that we strive for. A community of strangers uniting for one reason, Christ. And I know it can happen. My hometown experienced a coming together as one for one reason on a night nine years ago. And I never met this 19-year-old private. He was killed in action. He was from my hometown area, the, the town two towns over. He was a classmate and a friend of my niece's. And I know that many in my hometown had never met him either. Like I said, he was from the town, two towns over. They knew of him, maybe from sports or something, but not really. Knew his family, maybe. But they gathered on the side of the highway with hundreds of flags as that hearse passed by on that slow 100-mile drive down Highway 212 from the airport. They gave of their wealth. They stepped out of their self-sufficient world to recognize sacrifice, to honor the grief of their neighbor. It was a community of strangers united for one reason, to grieve as one young man whose favorite saying was, no regrets. I looked up thoughts and ideas around the these, this phrase, no regrets. You know, why, why that phrase? Why was that his favorite saying? What did it mean? I probably got a lot deeper than a 19-year-old kid does, but maybe not. I don't know. Here's some things I found. No regrets is an attitude that lives through tragedies. No regrets grows strong with trials, sees the calm after the storm, and knows the end is a new place yet to be explored. No regrets. No regrets is to face the hopelessness with a look of hope. Now what we've been talking about, face the hopelessness with a look of hope. Change your perspective. No regrets. To live a life of no regrets is to receive the grace and courage of God to step out of our comfort zone 
and live in authentic community and care. So I invite you to come today and receive the bread of life with no regrets. And then go forward in confidence to be the bread of life for others with no regrets. And maybe this is what Paul was leaning toward when he was praying in Ephesians 3. I fall down on my knees and I pray that your inward person be renewed day by day through the wear and tear of life's challenges and tribulations. In other words, live a life of no regrets. A life of hope for Jesus who dwells in your heart and takes permanent residence in your identity. May you test the length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full and filled in the fullness of God. No regrets. Amen.
trusting in our loving and almighty God, who abundantly provides the bread of life to all who hunger, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Loving God, we pray for all those who gather to celebrate the holy feast of Christ's body and blood. Strengthen every member of your church in love, faith, and service. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we raise to you for the beauty and abundance of your creation. Send sunshine and rain to nourish crops. Teach us to produce and distribute food with justice and generosity. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, you know every nation, every culture, and every people. Teach us to work together for peace and to love each other even when we cannot understand our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you hear the cries of the hungry, the sick, and the downcast. Send food, healing, and comfort to all who are in need, especially Becky, Donna, Crystal, Helen, Bob, Margaret, and Bill. Satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we thank and praise you for this congregation. Teach us to be a holy family, Christ's body, and for one another. Unite us in love and faith. We remember especially and give thanks for the family and friends of Connor. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for the beloved dead who taught us and fed us in the Christian faith, especially Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany, and the martyr Olaf, king of Norway. Hasten the feast that will remind, reunite us. We pray in sympathy for the friends and family of Pat and for the survivors and those who died in the Branson duck boat tragedy. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and loving God, you look upon, we look to you in hope and trust, knowing that you will do far more than we can imagine or ask. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. At this time, we'll have the offering.
Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come let us eat, for the feast is spread. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. We will commune by standing intention. So there will be two stations on either side. You'll come forward. You'll receive the bread. Hold on to it and then dip it into either the dark liquid, uh, which is in you know, the blue uh, glass, or the white liquid, which is wine, uh, grape juice, and I believe it's in the green. Um, all are welcome. Come, let us eat.
invite you to stand and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and this cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Uh, you may be seated for announcements, and for that, I will just turn your attention to the messenger and um, ask you to read through that, and you'll see the most recent announcements, and then there's a couple people that have things to say. Thanks. So I'm Vicki Donnell, and uh, I'm part of the call committee. And there's a couple of other people here, I think, from the call committee today. We're kind of regrouping after some time away for vacations. And of course, Maining is gone this week. Um, but Wes, please stand so people know who we are. They may have questions uh, during the service. So I think, I know everybody is interested in what's going on. And we try to keep you up informed in two ways, the spirit article, we try to do monthly announcements, and we're open for questions at any time. Call us, see us, stop us, whatever. But I was thinking today that it was, had been a month, and it was probably time for us to give you an update. I thought the best way to do that was to probably read Reverend Holy's communication to us. Reverend Holy is the bishop's associate, and he is our call process minister. So he is the one we're working directly with. Uh, you heard in previous spirit articles that we have interviewed two candidates. The interviews went very well. Um, they were both, um, we thought, very productive. But um, we did communicate with both of them that we would like to remain in communication with them we were not ready to release either one of them, but we were also not ready to go any further with them. Now, we struggle with this because we don't want to keep anybody hanging on if we need to turn them loose. And we pray about that, and we take that very seriously. Both of these pastors are in active congregations. Um, so we're not leaving people hanging out there. We are communicating with them at least every two weeks, and we have an understanding with them that if their situation changes or our situation changes, we will let each other know, okay? But we haven't been led by the Spirit to believe that we are ready uh, to make a decision on either one of these candidates at this time. So that's what we have done as far as interviews. Um, we communicate with Reverend Holy on a weekly or an every 10-day basis. And um, I'll just read you his message because, you know, he's in it with us. Um, and this is, he thanked me for our update. And then he said, to update you on our work here, there is one person currently looking at your site profile. So we are waiting for him to get back to us regarding his willingness to have his name submitted to you. We have calls into two other persons to see if they might consider looking at your profile, but have yet to hear back from them. One is presently out of the country, and the other could be on vacation as well. In addition, we also continue to look for more candidates for you. I communicated with him yesterday on my way back from a week of vacation, and I just said, you know, um, we need an update uh, from your last email, and this is what he said. Sorry to say the number of new profiles for consideration has been few. We sent your profile out to those two candidates for their consideration. We have yet to hear back from them. 
I want to remind you that um, you know our our candidates come from through the Senate office in another very valuable way that we're going to have candidates brought to our attention is through referrals okay and we've talked about this several times but we would encourage you as a call committee if you are aware of ELC pastors that you think might be, be in touch with the Holy Spirit, or maybe they haven't even thought about it, but if you would feel comfortable submitting their name, the forms are out on the table. We have had three names submitted to us. One was from a large congregation in Arizona. He said, thank you very much, but I've got a great congregation here. I'm not interested in a call. The other one was, I think, a large church in Iowa. And I don't believe we've heard back from him via Reverend Holy. And then we had one other one submitted by a member that uh, actually, his name was not on the roster for call. So I just want to tell you, this is an opportunity, and I was talking to somebody this morning, and they said, you know, I've been to two uh, church services in the last several weeks, and they were such great services, and I said, you know what? We're not trying to grab anybody's pastor, but you never know. You never know. We have a great story to tell here. So I think, you know, we'll work with the bishop's office and we'll keep you informed, but, and we'll pray. Your call to prayer is there every week, okay? But if you have or felt to make a referral, talk to any of us, and the forms are out on the table, and um, you don't even, the form is very easy. We'll submit the form to the bishop's office, they'll vet the candidate, okay? And then they'll be in touch with us about that, and you will hear back, okay? You will hear back the result of your referral, okay? I think um, if there are any questions, I would just say I'll be in the back. Rob is here. Wes is here. Uh, we'll be in the back if you have questions. Um, we won't take any more time here, okay? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to remind you of a phrase from our reading this morning. It said that Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And that reminded me of the Christian women's event on November 9th and 10th from the Fresh Grounded Faith group here in Springfield. It's being hosted at one of the host churches, which is Second Baptist. This is a Friday night and a Saturday morning event. And I invite any women of our church or your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors to join us. I will need your payment for the early bird price of $39 for tickets no later than August the 12th so that I can get our tickets at that reduced rate. So I'd like you to look at your calendar, see if that's something that you might be interested in. It's not anything at all to replace our worship service, but to give us a little extra inspiration outside of the walls of our individual church. It's a non-denominational event, and I invite you to consider that. I'll wait outside in the mission hall after the service today, too, if you have any other questions. Thank you. Please stand for the benediction. And now may God the Creator, God the Liberator, and God the Enlightener bless you now and forever. Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture you, grow the resources for growing ministries, offer healing and care to all. Go in peace. The Spirit sends us forth to serve.